In 2004, Sony made their first foray into the handheld game console market with the PlayStation Portable, and to great success. The system sold over 80 million units, and while it was handily beaten by the Nintendo DS, it was still a strong sign that the core gaming audience was hungry for home console quality titles on the go, something the PSP delivered in spades. But as time went on, the hardware really started showing its age, and the lack of a touchscreen or second analog stick limited the types of experiences the system could provide, a sentiment that coincided with the explosion in popularity of console first-person shooters. One trip into 2008 YouTube shows there was a market for these games on handhelds, and while attempts were certainly made, the PSP just wasn't up to the task. Enter the PlayStation Vita, Sony's next-gen portable project that sought to bring the PSP into the modern age. A second analog stick, not one but two touch surfaces, and a whole slew of online and cross-device features that would carry the device not only through the PS3's lifespan, but its successors too. The thought of finally getting a true Call of Duty game on the go was an appealing one, and with Black Ops 2 nearing release, Activision set out to make it a reality. Nihilistic Software were assisted by mercenary technology in adapting the franchise for the handheld, and Black Ops to Classify was announced at E3 2012, just a few weeks after the launch of Nihilistic's previous game, Resistance Burning Skies. News that Nihilistic will be responsible for Declassified caused some concern, and rightly so. Their first game, Vampire the Masquerade Redemption, was also their best reviewed by a decent margin. From there, though, it was all downhill. The studio's second project was StarCraft Ghost, a game most famous for never actually coming out. Fast forward to 2011, and Nihilistic had released PlayStation Move Heroes to little fanfare, before turning their focus towards the upcoming PlayStation Vita. Unfortunately, the Vita was already off to a rocky start, and so too was Nihilistic's efforts on the handheld. Fans expected console-quality games, but even the most positive reviews admitted that Burning Skies was anything but. Jim Sterling had previously crowned Resistance as the worst game on the Vita, a title that lasted less than six months, at which point Black Ops The Classified somehow managed to review even worse. I'm convinced instead that Nihilistic is a group of performance artists creating works of intangible brilliance to break the fourth wall and satirize the video game industry. These are not video games, these are macabre comedies that, like the late Andy Kaufman, make use of elaborate pranks without necessarily letting the audience in on the goof. At least that's what I'm going to have to tell myself, because admitting that a game like The Classified could be made in earnest is just too damn depressing. Polygon called The Classified stilted and heartless, and even in a world where Final Fronts had existed for years, many declared it the new lowest point in the entire Call of Duty franchise. As someone who bought a Vita on day one, I very much echoed the frustrations of those who felt the system lacked compelling software early on. After Uncharted, Unit 13, and even Ridge Racer let me down, Black Ops The Classified didn't seem worth the monetary risk. And I sold my Vita before the year was out. Don't get me wrong, 2012 definitely held some great games for the system, but nothing drove me to keep it. But it's been nine years, and I've finally played Black Ops The Classified. Though there is a bit of an asterisk next to that statement. When reviewing games, I prioritize playing on real hardware over everything, and around this time last year, that philosophy led me to once again sell my Vita and pick up a PlayStation TV. Sony's micro console that is, for all intents and purposes, a PS Vita and PSP without a screen or buttons. You plug it into a TV, sync up a controller, and boom, you've got a Vita on the big screen, or in my case, on a capture card. Granted, the system can't play every Vita game, only ones on a whitelist approved by Sony. Games only worked on the PS TV if they didn't require Vita-specific features, like touch surfaces or cameras, or were otherwise modified by the developer to remove said requirements. I rather foolishly assumed that Black Ops would be one of these games. It's Call of Duty, I said. It's a direct translation of a game primarily designed for controllers. Surely, it would work out of the box. Right? <laughs> no. But I wasn't giving up that easily. Thanks to the efforts of the Vita's excellent homebrew scene, not only was I able to whitelist, or should I say, declassify, the game and run it on my PS TV, but I was able to use the extra buttons and touchpad on a PS4 controller to almost completely restore the game's functionality that would otherwise be lost for want of a touchscreen. Assigning specific screen regions to L1 and R1 allows me to throw grenades as you'd expect, while R3 touches the screen to prompt the melee attack. Remapping L3 to down on the D-pad restores typical sprint controls, while left on the D-pad touches the killstreak button. The very few things that still require touchscreen inputs, like the mortar strikes, can still be operated via the touchpad, albeit not very precisely. The only thing I absolutely can't do is hold my breath with a sniper rifle, and that's more because I'm too lazy to figure out how to work a back touchpad input into the DS4's layout. This configuration works so well that it's actually unfair in multiplayer, but it's not perfect. For lack of a better word, the aiming just feels... off. 
almost like the right stick is not an analog axis, but instead bound to four binary directional inputs. Like how some old PS2 games feel. I did briefly play this game on a normal Vita last year and noticed the same thing, so it's definitely not the controller mapping, it's the engine. Even still though, the DualShock 4 works well enough to give an unfair advantage in multiplayer, but this being a portable game and all, the offline content is a bit more pressing, so we'll start with that first. There is a pocket-sized elephant in the room that must be addressed. Yes, this game is almost entirely comprised of reused content from the original Black Ops. The few things that aren't from Black Ops are from the Modern Warfare games. I'd go as far as to say there isn't a single original asset in Declassified. That may sound like a bad thing, but it does have a silver lining. The game looks basically identical to Black Ops 1. Weapons, maps, and characters all look and sound exactly how they should. While it may be a little rough around the edges, I don't get the hate for this game's visuals, because as far as I'm concerned, this is the closest anything on the system has come to replicating a PS3 game. Either the Vita, or more likely, Nihilistic's engine, are being pushed to their absolute limit here. But that's not to say this is a one-to-one -one copy of Black Ops. That visual flair comes at the cost of scale and fluidity. Almost every single mission and map in this game is absolutely tiny. Campaign missions last less than five minutes, and the multiplayer and survival levels are about half the size of your typical Black Ops map. Don't go into this expecting Nuketown. The best the classified can do is Nuke House. As the name implies, it's Nuketown cut in half, so only one of the houses is accessible. The other maps are similarly rearranged or pared down from their original versions, with the exception of Container, this game's version of Shipment. Which, um, yeah, you heard me correctly, this game has shipment from the original Modern Warfare, likely for the sole reason that it saved developers time while bolstering the map roster. The campaign missions have been cobbled together out of Black Ops 1 maps, and they even make something resembling an attempt to tell a canon story in the Black Ops universe. But the flavor text consists of pretty bare-bones excuses for the player to do typical COD things, like planting bombs or breaching doors, and the man responsible for voicing the cutscenes sounds just as bored as his audience. In terms of gameplay, the classified single-player missions suffer an identity crisis. They're stuck between being five-minute pick-up-and-play romps and a serious core experience for those who want to take Call of Duty with them on the go. These are difficult, but for the wrong reasons. The AI teeter between mind-lemmingly stupid and actual aimbots, firing at you behind walls before you even turn the corner. There's no checkpoint system, so one mistake means starting from square one. And this would be fine, as these missions are incredibly short, except there are only ten of them, meaning they provide less than an hour's worth of content. If there were twice as many, this would be almost okay. But instead, players are left with an unsatisfying, unremarkable chunk of content. There is a time trial mode, which is just a few maps from the story ops, with Modern Warfare 2's pit targets awkwardly scattered about them. These are fine, I guess, but they last a collective three minutes, and the controls aren't tight enough to make replaying them anything beyond frustrating. Those who wanted a solid on-the-go experience likely spent more time in the game's Hostiles mode, otherwise known as a watered-down version of Modern Warfare 3's survival missions. These take place on multiplayer maps and are your standard, mindless horde mode. Those terrible AI from the operations fare even worse here. They have the same basic lack of pathing, but now they just meander around the map until they bump into the player and get gunned down. I have time to eat my sandwich while I play without pausing. <laughs> Good sandwich. Bro, where the fuck are you? This puts the onus on the player to go on the offensive, and hunt down the enemies themselves. Two problems, though. It removes the strategic element of holding up somewhere with mines and turrets, and more crucially, it makes acquiring new items a complete pain in the ass. In Modern Warfare 3, items were acquired at shops scattered around the map, and while you were encouraged to visit them during downtime, they remained open in case you couldn't get there. In Declassified, there is no shop, but instead, care packages drop during round intermissions. These could be ammo, a random weapon, a sentry gun, or a mortar strike. The latter isn't all that useful on a PS4 controller, because I have to guess where on the touchpad corresponds to the part of the map I want to bomb. And unless you stay right next to it, the sentry gun disappears after about 15 seconds. This leaves ammo and weapon boxes, which are crucial to your survival, since they're the only way to get more munitions short of scrounging up five bolts at a time off dead bodies. Issue. Where the shop remains open after the start of the round of Modern Warfare 3, the Classified's care packages despawn the instant the next round begins. You have 15 seconds to identify where the crate spawned, run there, and then hold the square button for 2 seconds. If you're a millisecond too late, you go into the next round without any ammo. Likewise, you have to sacrifice one of your guns to get a new one, with no choice to drop it and recover your ammo if you get something bad, like a Mac 11 or a crossbow. Uh, Alright. 
which has a grand total of six shots before you have to drop it. How anyone thought that these were good ideas is beyond me, and the lack of a proper shop strips this mode of so much depth it could have had. But it gets worse. The AI spawn in four at a time, and you'll never be tasked with killing more than 16 in one round. There's no helicopter round or attack dogs, and while suicide bombers are eventually thrown into the mix, they're removed not too long after. And here comes the fatal flaw. Do me a favor and picture your favorite horde or wave survival mode. Think about how it works. In all likelihood, you're faced with endless waves of opponents that grow progressively more numerous, perhaps with better equipment or more health. The game either becomes about surviving as long as possible, or maybe reaching a specific end goal through any number of routes or methods. But in Black Ops Declassified, this isn't the case. After the game's hardest wave, about 12 waves in, it restarts from the beginning. You'll go back to fighting smaller waves of shotgunners instead of larger waves with automatic long-range weapons. Suicide bombers completely disappear until you've looped back around to where they're introduced again. This mode has no longevity, and the only reason to keep playing is you have absolutely positively nothing else to do. This would be an okay way to kill time on a bus, but like, why would I buy a $250 handheld, a $50 memory card, and a retail game when, years earlier, Activision released a much better portable horror mode in the form of Call of Duty Zombies for iOS? A rhetorical question, of course. I know exactly why, and it's likely the same reason you're all still watching this video. Speaking of which, Zombies isn't here, if you were wondering. This game does in fact have online multiplayer, and as per usual, the only mode I was able to consistently play was Team Deathmatch. Though I did manage to luck out and play a couple of matches of Free For All. I've played a pretty decent amount of Declassified over the last couple of weeks, and let me just say, this was an experience. Not a good one, but not necessarily a bad one either. To Nihilistic's credit, their attention to detail was pretty staggering. The Call of Duty multiplayer experience is pretty much spot on. Create a class, kill streaks, hell, even the UI, spawns, and equipment work exactly how you'd expect. Granted, I may be playing with a controller rather than an actual Vita, but it's incredible how close they got to the real thing, doubly so when considering this isn't even the Call of Duty engine. It's the same engine Nihilistic developed for Burning Skies. And until I found that out, I could have been fooled. Minute stuff like throwing back and cooking grenades, reload cancelling, and killstreak stacking just works. And what results is an incredibly authentic COD multiplayer experience on the go, with its own features. Such as near classes, which lets you share classes with strangers you met on the street, a la Nintendo 3DS Street Pass. Of course, this assumes you happen to run into one of the five of the people in your state that had a Vita, but I digress. After the last gen Black Ops 3 video, some Redditors decided I was a COD hater out to make the game look bad. This is verifiably untrue, so let's get a few things straight. One, I love this franchise, and I've been playing it religiously since the original Modern Warfare. Two, I wouldn't make videos about this game for a living if I didn't at least like or care about them in some capacity. I will absolutely sing the praises of a Call of Duty port when I feel it deserves it. And for all of the Classified's flaws, it deserves praise for this multiplayer mode. Playing this game on a big TV with a PS4 controller doesn't do justice to just how impressive it is that this is a handheld adaptation. The fact that this is a game you can take with you on the go, with nothing other than the console itself, is incredible. Does it feel as good as the real thing? Hell no. The aim will randomly jump to the side, a known issue with no discernible cause or fix. The net could result in constant trade kills in a series where that's not normally possible. Ghost dots on the radar represent non-existent enemies, and tomahawks don't stick to people they kill, so they get lost to the void more often than not. Though that does open the door to pretty sick double kills. The glitches and lack of polish do hurt the experience a little bit, but you can take this with you anywhere you can get an internet connection. Even to this day, people are still playing this in pretty decent numbers, and it's easy to lose an hour or two at a time without thinking too much about the game's shortcomings. Even though this is a different game and a different engine, my familiarity with Call of Duty's controls and gameplay carries over perfectly, and to me, that's the sign of a successful translation. But I don't mean to mindlessly praise. Declassified is good, but it definitely could stand to be better, and most of its problems come down to the maps. As previously mentioned, the maps are all cut-down versions of Black Ops staples. They play fine, but I'm not really sure why they're so small. I don't believe the Vita can't handle a full-sized nuketown. So the logical conclusion is that it was done to make the maps work for lower player counts. And while that may benefit all three people who played their Vita over local ad hoc, maps like Nuke House are simply too small for public lobbies. It's not uncommon for enemy players to pop into existence right before your eyes, or for enemies to spawn directly behind you and end your streak. Not that that's a disqualifier for Call of Duty multiplayer, but whatever. Team Deathmatch on console only operates with 12 people at most. Losing two players didn't justify slicing the maps in half. Perhaps worst of all, the frame rate drops to single digits at the lowest points. Combined with the low FOV, it was enough to make me motion sick, a feat previously only pulled off by no less than Doom 64. 
This has likely more to do with me playing this on a normal sized TV and not mobile device, but it's worth mentioning and the frame rate is still a problem either way. Minor flaws all considered and not unique to this game, but one complaint I do level a bit more seriously is the lack of a bot mode. On a handheld console where not even 3G models can play online without Wi-Fi, the option to play multiplayer objective modes with bots would have been huge for the core audience this game was aimed at, and its absence was disappointing. I say that as if it's an oversight, but let's be real, I know why it's not here. At this point, I feel there's one thing I can say with absolute certainty. This game was developed on a time frame shorter than the average pregnancy. Rumor has it that the dev period was as short as 5 months, starting immediately after Nihilistic shift burning skies which admittedly would explain why the game's E3 reveal consisted of nothing beyond a logo. There was nothing to show at that point. Black Ops The Classified may be a little bit of a shit show, but I'll be honest, I'm still glad I played it. Until Call of Duty Mobile came out in 2019, this was the closest you could get to a fully-fledged Call of Duty game on the go. It's just a shame that Activision forced it out the door the way they did. Given the proper time and care, I don't doubt this game could have been great. Hell, they might have even been able to port Black Ops 1 directly to the system. Instead, what we got was an iPhone-quality game on a console made specifically for people who wanted something more. And consequently, we witnessed the death of a studio that couldn't catch a break. From cancelled StarCraft spin-offs to multiple rushed, half-hearted Sony exclusives, Nihilistic weren't given a fair chance to succeed. And it seems we'll never know what could have been. Everything we know about this game aligns with the theory that it was developed in just a few short months. Whether development started after Resistance was finished, or slightly before, it doesn't make much of a difference. Either way, Nihilistic never produced another game. Actually, there's nothing to suggest they even continued to operate after November of 2012. I'm not so sure I buy the studio head statement that they were pivoting development to mobile games. An official press release claimed that everyone from the industry was suffering from reduced sales and interest, which, uh, wasn't exactly true. And I'm not so sure that the powers that be didn't just pull the plug. That studio head I mentioned earlier, Robert Hubner, he left Nihilistic immediately after Black Ops' release. And by the next month, he moved on to a new job working on the mobile strategy game War Commander. Eventually, he was the executive producer on Need for Speed No Limits, so we really have come full circle. I've not been able to track down many other ex-Nihilistic employees, so I'm not sure what they're up to today. But I have to say, it is really strange for a company to publicly rebrand only to completely drop off the face of the earth a matter of weeks later. Despite the company's claims that market trends are the reason they were leaving the business, Nihilistic's failure likely had much more to do with their consistent mediocrity, even if said mediocrity wasn't always their fault. Thanks for watching, and also thanks so much for the recent boom in support, subscriptions, and patrons. You guys are awesome, and not only do you make what I do worthwhile, you make it possible in the first place. I've had a lot of cool ideas for videos lately, and I'm working on several of them at the same time. I'm not sure which you'll see first, but I expect the pace to remain relatively quick going forward. Also, if you want to see DS reviews in the near future, head over to Patreon and help support to reach that stretch goal. This will allow me to get a 3DS capture card and review stuff like Call of Duty's DS multiplayer modes, which I'm very excited to talk about soon. As usual, it's time for some Q&A questions. Do you like strategy games as a genre, and would there be a chance you'd review one? I don't dislike strategy games, but I've never been particularly good at them. Mostly because I don't play many of them. There are a couple of my two playlists that might end up as the content, but nothing I'm ready to talk about yet. Favorite Hot Pursuit game? Honestly, EA Seattle's Hot Pursuit 2. I know, unpopular opinion, but I have so much nostalgia for that version of the game. It's one of the first games I remember playing as a kid, and to this day, its soundtrack and aesthetics are still top-notch. How long does it take to make a video? I don't keep a timer running, but if I had to guess, a 15-minute video takes about 30-40 to 40 hours of concentrated effort. Going back for specific footage, writing and rewriting, voiceover recording and editing, assembling the footage, picking music, fist-fighting Adobe Premiere, it all really, really adds up. That's why I don't force myself to make videos I'm not psyched to make right then and there. If I'm not even in the mood to play a game, I'm certainly not going to be in the mood to think about it and stare at it for 40 hours straight, and that will come across in my writing. What brand of glue do you usually consume? Elmer's. It's like Coca-Cola. You can't go wrong with the classics. 